Good morning, everyone. My name is Professor Katherine Phillips. I'm the Ruben Mark Professor of Organizational Character and the director of the Bernstein Center for Leadership and Ethics at Columbia Business School. And it is my pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. I know we have a lot of alumni, faculty, staff, students in the room. And this is the second year that we've done this conference. So I'd like to see your hands if you've been here before. You see your hands, you see, you see they all came back which meant that this was an amazing conference, so you are in for a special treat. Um, this is a partnership between Columbia Business School and Vista Equity Partners. We're so excited to be partnering with Robert Smith and his team to talk about the topic of women in business leadership and tech. Now, we know that there's uh, a lot to learn about gender issues all around our um, um, business environment, but technology has been a special place where these issues have been especially sticky. So we're very proud to be featuring this conversation here today, and we know there's a lot that we'll learn from the people on the stage here today. And all of the business leaders and academics uh, and scholars and, and leaders who are doing work in this area that you will learn from here today. Now at Columbia Business School, we've been investing quite a lot in tech. Uh, in our curriculum, in our programming, we have been introducing classes like on blockchain, uh, and technology, entrepreneurship, and others, because we know that this is uh, a place where we have to make sure that we are preparing leaders to lead in the technology space. We have also um, been looking for and partnering with people like Robert Smith and other alumni who have, came, who have come to us uh, with a desire and a vision to make sure that this topic is being talked about, that it's being uh, put into the forefront of everybody's thinking so that we can all contribute to where we go with this issue. So today I'd like to introduce to you all Robert Smith. We're thrilled to have with us Robert F. Smith. He is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Vista Equity Partners. Robert is also a member of the Board of Overseers at Columbia Business School and an alumnus of the class of 1994. In addition to being an excellent judge of business schools, Robert has made a career <laughs> of spotting early trends and opportunities. He began his career as an engineer, earning his BS in chemical engineering from Cornell and working at Kraft General Foods, where he earned two US and two European patents. He then made the decision to study finance at Columbia Business School and went on to work for Goldman Sachs, eventually rising to co-head of enterprise systems and storage investment banking, where he advised on over $50 billion worth of deals from 1994 to 2000. It's a great start to a young career. Mm -hmm. Robert's approach to investing has been shaped by his background as an engineer. He searches for elegant solutions to complex problems, which has drawn him to software and technology. Since founding Vista in 2000, Robert has overseen 380 completed transactions by the firm, representing over $120 billion in transaction value. Currently, Vista manages over $46 billion, and Vista's portfolio of over 50 software companies employs over 60,000 people worldwide. If you have a chance to talk to Robert about the biggest challenges facing companies in the tech sector today, the conversation inevitably leads to the competition for talent. Robert believes that in order for his companies to succeed, and more broadly for the US and global economy to reach its full potential, it's essential that leaders, that leaders identify, develop, and promote top-notch talent, no matter his or her background. Vista far outperforms the private equity sector with women representing 41% of Vista's employees and 23% of senior roles at the firm. Now this is compared to 17.9% and 9.9% respectively for the broader sector. So you can see they're clearly outperforming the competition. This commitment extends to Vista's portfolio companies as well, where 30% of external board members are women, compared with 7% in the broader tech industry. And while women at Vista represent more than double the sector averages, Robert will be the first to tell you there is much more work to be done, which is why we are here today. How can we provide more and better opportunities for women to enter, advance, and succeed in the tech sector? What can leaders do to create a culture 
that fosters advancement of women at all levels of the organization? And what advice can trailblazing women, CEOs, like the ones who are on this stage here today with us, what can they tell us to help women at earlier stages in their career? So we're excited to have Robert and his team here with us. He's going to facilitate in this first session a conversation with three women CEOs from Vista Own Companies to hear their perspectives, to answer your questions, and to get us started with this amazing conference. So thank you all so much for being here this morning. Great. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you. I mean, thank you, Catherine, thank you for the wonderful uh, warm introduction. Before we get started, I want to recognize these three spectacular women CEOs of tech companies. So let's give them a round of applause first for doing what they do. You know, we, we, we talk a lot at Vista about this whole idea of uh, performance. And you know, you've heard some of our statistics and our numbers, et cetera, and we continue to, to thrive to expand what is an inclusive environment to make sure that our companies represent what the world represents and gives us an opportunity to, again, uh, you know, lead forward in our returns, in our representation of who we are, and in our culture. And an elegant solution to a complex problem for us is partnering with Columbia here. It is bringing together women who are business leaders, who are looking for mentorship, and creating environments for that to actually foster and develop you know, those critical relationships that can accelerate a career. And these three women are gonna talk about, these women are gonna talk a little bit about their careers and how that has helped them, the relationships has helped them drive themselves to the point of being CEOs of companies that are now represent over a billion dollars in revenue. I think you all have over 40,000 customers combined and about 3,500 employees worldwide. So again, a round of applause for what they've built and what they've done. I want to first start with, uh, with Sajel Pietrasak. So, you know, Sajel and I met uh, it's probably six or seven years ago when she was a senior executive of one of our companies, the Active Networks. Uh, she is now the CEO of one of our companies, Dealer Socket. And Dealer Socket sells into the automobile dealership world. And if you want to talk about a very male dominated <laughs> world, probably 98% of your customers are old white males. Is that about right? <laughs> okay. Yeah, and she percent. is very successful in engaging in, in creating a very profitable and well-running business in, uh, on her own. Be before that, at the Active Network, uh, Sage was one of our senior executives there. Um, I think, Sage, you all touched about one-third of the U.S. population every quarter with some of your registration and activity systems. Exactly. So understands big business, how to manage uh, companies, and how to manage people who, frankly, look differently and think differently than, than, than you and have been very successful at it. So, Sage, welcome, and we'll, we'll get to you to, to talk <coughs> first about your experience. Uh, Amy Zupon. Amy has been with This is Amy's also second tour of duty uh, mm -hmm. at Vista. She was the CEO mm -hmm. of one of our companies, P2, fourth? Third. It's my third. Okay, yeah. you're right. Sorry. <laughs> before P2, right. So before uh, and she was at P2 as CEO, that was one of, one of our successful exits. Actually, the active network, we're now tracking about a four times return on that deal. P2 was 3.5 times yeah. return, and we're expecting now she's running one of our biggest companies, Vertifor, uh, which has, uh, I think, about 28,000 customers. Is yeah, that about right? 28,000, 1,400 employees. Yeah, and for, it's 1,400 employees. And you know what we actually do with that business is actually provide solutions for uh, 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 again the um, uh, autom oh, sorry the insurance brokerage market marketplace. So and dealing with also uh, insurance principles. So uh, welcome again, Amy, to 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 the stage. And uh, last but not least, uh, least Lisa. Uch Schneider, get it to get it? Excellent. All right, okay. So Lisa is a recent uh, add to the Vista family. She runs one of our companies, IAS, and basically operates in the ecosystem of advertising. Prior to that, she spent about 10 years at Microsoft and how many years at Amazon? Uh, six years at Amazon. And uh, built a very large, you know, multi-billion dollar business at Amazon and has joined us to now run one of our companies uh, at, in, in the Vista portfolio. So welcome to the portfolio. Uh, so let's start first, Sajer. I want to start with you and talk a little bit about you know, the narrative of how you became a CEO and what it took for you to decide this is what I want to do and the risk-taking mentality you had to have to make that happen. So please start, say a little about your experience and your expression. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to the next hour with all of you. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting because 
joining a technology company may be something that, you know, I never had a degree in engineering or math, um, computer science, and, and it's not something that I thought I would do. And, you know, when I had the opportunity, um, it was uh, when I was working in financial services. I was actually at Wells Fargo Bank in San Francisco, and the CEO of a small startup called Active Network, um, about 100 employees at the time, called me. I had met him a few years prior and said, you know, why don't you come in and talk to us? The interesting thing is it, it was a week and a day after I had uh, just had my first baby and when he called me. And, and it was a big leap of faith for myself and then my husband as well, to leave San Francisco and move several weeks later. We both left our jobs in San Francisco, but we took that leap of faith. We took that risk because it was something that we believed that would be an incredible opportunity. And hence, you know, now, 15 years later, um, I have the opportunity to be working with Vista Equity Partners and, and uh, in my second Vista Role. But, you know, I would, I would recommend for, you know, all of you who are thinking about those kinds of opportunities, take the risk, you know, take that leap of faith. It really, it, you could fail, but, you know, success is in the struggle. And, and, you know, you could also find that it's the best thing you've ever done. And, and for me, it really, it really was. Great. And Amy, talk a little bit about, you know, your career and, and the arc of your narrative and how you got to now be CEO of a second, the second time uh, of, a, of a software company. No, it's great. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's terrific to be with you all today. Um, you know, similar to Sejal, very early in my career, I had the opportunity to join a startup company and it was in the software and consulting space. And I got to lead the development of a brand new software platform for a particular industry. It was a terrific opportunity. It was all the things that you thought it would be, the hard work, the late nights, the kind of, you know, growing up with your career and spending all this time with people who cared as much about the cause as you did at the end of the day. And I took that risk to be there. But shortly after I joined that company, I had a, a woman partner. Um, I didn't work for her. Um, she was at the startup and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, you know, you should be a partner at this startup. And, mm -hmm. and it was all based on kind of what I was driving and how I was accomplishing things. And, you know, I didn't work for her, right? She, she, leaded, she led another part of the business, but that mm -hmm. opportunity that she gave me, that tap on the shoulder, that pull forward, which I deserved, right, really kind of set me down this path on the career opportunity. And years later, we ended up selling that company to Vista, mm -hmm and who integrated it into <coughs> Ventex, which was a portfolio company at the time. And that's kind of how my career got started and had an opportunity at Ventex and then an opportunity to take on another role. Mm -hmm. And you know, you knock it out of the park in what you're doing. And before you know it, the door opens on that next fundamental opportunity. And it's just been a terrific ride for me. But when I think about how I got here, I think about those moments very early on for me. Yeah. Lisa, you started at some very large companies. Mm -hmm. Talk a bit about your, your role, your narrative, sure. and when you decided, okay, listen, I can actually take not only a senior management job, but become a CEO, sure. and what led you to those conclusions? Yeah, um, so I've spent 20 years working for tech companies, uh, large tech companies, Robert had mentioned, 10 years Microsoft, six years Amazon, three years Yahoo, uh, primarily in the digital advertising space, uh, but per Prior to joining Microsoft, I was actually early in my career, right out of college, in the not-for-profit sector. I was writing grants, I was fundraising, and it didn't quite feel like the right fit. And I quickly realized I'd be much uh, happier in sales. Mm -hmm. And so I interviewed with Microsoft, who was on the enterprise side of the business, uh, for a very entry-level junior role. And I actually got a rejection letter from Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And I remember, and this is back in the day like snail mail where you literally received <laughs> the, the yeah. car, and I still have that letter. Right. Um, but I received a rejection letter, and I remember just holding that letter and thinking, this is just unacceptable. <laughs> and the next day, and I have to admit, this is pre-cell phone. The next day, I called the recruiter at Microsoft, and you know, in my nice, polite there way, there must be a mistake. I said, "Hello, <laughs> you know, I'd like to understand why you rejected me, and I'd like another shot at interviewing for a job at Microsoft." And she said, "You know, you need, you didn't demonstrate enough passion." I mm -hmm. said, "Okay, give me another shot. And I don't care how junior the job is. I want to get in, and mm -hmm. I will do whatever it takes to come work at Microsoft." 
So she said, well, we, I could hear like going through the jobs. We do have this one extremely junior job. I said, give me a shot. Mm -hmm. So I went in, I interviewed for the job, I got the job. Over the course of 10 years at Microsoft, made it to partner, general manager, onto Amazon, the rest is history. But the story there is just never give up yeah. and never settle and be unapologetic about your ambitions and your career aspirations and go for it. Yeah. I want to take the covers off your careers for a minute if, we, if I can and really talk about mentorship, sponsorship, the importance of finding, developing, actually cultivating those sort of relationships and how that helped you and how you're actually able to pay it forward. And Amy, let's start with you because I want to, we, we've yeah. talked a little bit about this and I want to, and you mentioned it for, for a moment there, but I want to hear a little bit more about how that mentorship and that sponsorship changed your career and your career trajectory. Yeah, so I, I was very fortunate early in my career. I mentioned this woman who tapped me on the shoulder. You know, she really, she became a, um, a safe space for me, right? Mm. Some a place that I could go and have a conversation around anything, a challenge, a frustration, an opportunity, a venting moment, whatever it might be. And that kind of open dialogue helped me really build confidence, frankly, as I was tackling issues and working through things. And I really looked to her. Um, you know, I think for anyone who I, I talk with who has the opportunity to grow their career as a female, they all have found that community. They have found that sponsor, whether it's an individual or if it's a community of people that you have access to. Um, I think it's really important. It does two things. You know, it allows you to pay it forward to other folks, but you can also you, you get confidence from those conversations. What was the most valuable piece of specific that? advice that she gave you and that, that you continue to pass forward? Oh, gosh, you can do it, right? You know, you know, at the end of the day, she said to me, I remember we were sitting there having a conversation and, you know, I, I, we were talking about, you know, do we think this is right? Do we know this is right? How do we go back and forth? And she said to me, she's like, you know, you know exactly what it is that you need to do, and you should have the confidence in your own instincts to execute. And when I talk with women today, I pass forward that concept of trust your instincts, right? Mm -hmm. you, you know what needs to be done. Don't look for somebody to acknowledge it. Trust right. your instincts. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Lisa, I want you to answer that same question, then I'm going to get mm -hmm. through Sage. Talk, talk a bit about you know, what you found in navigating very large tech companies in terms of A, support, the opportunity for sponsorship and now to sponsor as an executive and, and give us a sense for what you learned sure. and what you passed forward. So um, I'm a big believer there's a difference between mentorship and executive sponsor. Yeah. At Microsoft I was fortunate to have both with very senior level women. Uh, one mentor, I actually sought her out while we were building the advertising business over here. She was a rising star in the enterprise business and I intentionally sought out a mentor in a different business so I could learn something else. And one thing I noticed early on in her career is, you know, she was a working mom. She had two kids. She was commuting into the city, and her career was going like this. Mm -hmm. And I also noticed that every year, in addition to her day job, she was driving pretty major strategy at the company. And I asked her, how would you do this? And she said, every Friday, I carve out two hours every Friday, 1 to 3 o'clock. My entire team knows it is my think time. I identify one challenge or opportunity in the company. I put it into my annual goals. I create different teams and V teams every year. And I drive to that goal outside of my day job. And the only way I can get it done is making the time embedding it in my goal and being measured against it. So she's a mentor. Executive sponsor, what that is, is there is a senior leader who's in that room when senior executives and management, they're making decisions about promotions. They're calibrating individuals. They're talking about who are we going to invest in? Who are the high potentials? And that executive sponsor has your back in that room. The one thing I learned so much from her, but one thing, it was more subtle that I learned from her. So she was based in San Francisco. She was traveling up to Redmond every mm -hmm. week, mm -hmm. Monday to Thursday night. She'd come home Friday mornings, do all of her internal calls. So our one-on-ones every Friday morning, it was right. 10 a.m. my time, 7 a.m. her mm -hmm. time, 
her girls were getting ready for school. So she'd be doing the one-on-one -on, -one <laughs> on the conference <laughs> call, Saturday. and she'd be like, come yeah. on, Kisa, you got to braid your hair. Mm -hmm. She'd be braiding the hair. Yeah. She'd be, and she yeah. was like multitasking and doing it and focused on the one-on-one -on -one and making sure the backpack was packed for school. It was before I had children, mm -hmm. but it was a senior level female role model walking the talk right. and demonstrating how she was making it happen both in her professional life and her personal life. Yeah, that's great. Sejal, you're taking on a very, or you took on a very, uh, you know, frankly, you know, daunting challenge walking in as a CEO of a founder-led company where it was basically littered with a, with a senior management team of all fraternity friends, in essence. I mean, they kind of, grew, literally, that, that's, the, that's the environment she walked into and has done a spectacular job. What gave you, A, the confidence to go do that, and B, how, are you, how do you think about driving a culture in that organization where women are gonna be more accepted and frankly thrive in your executive management team? Well, um, so I'll, I'll answer two different parts. Um, the first part, you know, I first came in and, and you have a leadership mantra, the thing that has brought you to where you are today. And, and if um, everyone in the room doesn't have one, it's, it's good to think about it. It's good to figure out what yours is. For me, um, my leadership mantra, and I talked about this on my very first day to the entire company, it's integrity, presence, and purpose, three things. Um, and so integrity, and I talked to the entire company about what that means to me. That means accountability. That means being open and honest and transparent and communicating. And it also means building an inclusive environment. And so, you know, inclusive for being open to diversity, being open to new ideas, being open um, to making sure that we're having that, that sort of diverse and, and inclusive environment. Um, and so I brought that in and, and I talk about that every time I have an opportunity at a town hall or an all staff meeting. And it's something that, you know, I think helped as we were creating new values and operating principles and our culture, um, you know, across our business. Mm -hmm. um, it's something that, that our team really believes in and, and, and it helped, I think, really create that, that sort of theme around, around where we wanted to go as a company as well. Um, and, then, and then the second part, um, remind me of what it was. Just the, the challenges of driving, you know, again, driving the culture in an organization and what gave you the confidence to say, I'm gonna go do this? Yeah, you know, the confidence, um, you know, it, it, it's part of having that inner strength. It's about, you know, I talked about earlier, taking that leap of faith at my previous, you know, moving into technology and taking that leap of faith. And then it's again, you're taking a leap of faith, joining, I didn't know anything about automotive when I started um, in the automotive industry, but I knew a lot about software. I knew a lot about what creates success at companies. And I knew about the fact that software is really a people, people company, mm -hmm. right? Your asset is your people. And, and we did everything we could to be able to drive and, and, and hire and, and bring aboard the right people. And since then, we've, we've uh, really increased our, our you know, diversity and, and uh, a lot of women leaders have joined the organization as well. Right. And Amy, you had to, in essence, rebuild your management team when you took right. over Vertifor. Talk a bit about the challenges you had and what, you know, what your management team now looks like. Yeah. So I joined Vertifor about two and a half years ago, and it's a, we've, we've enjoyed 50 years of success. We're actually celebrating 50 years this year, but we're really kind of at the spot of almost reinventing ourselves for the future, right? Mm -hmm. um, bringing in a lot of terrific talent and also driving innovation, technology innovation into the business ultimately for our customers. Mm -hmm. uh, as part of that, had the opportunity to really build a leadership team. You know, I, my leadership style has a lot to do with the nine years I spent as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And I really carry that forward with me in everything mm -hmm. that I do. And even as I've gone on to lead bigger and more complicated companies, I still kind of bring that to the table. And I went looking for the types of people that support that or you know, want to be a part of that, will drive that innovation, focus on those outcomes. Uh, you know, I'm super proud to say that 50% of my executive team is female. Um, and that is unheard of in technology and it's unheard of in insurance, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm incredibly proud of that. But I'm also really proud to say that we didn't go out and say that's what we're gonna do, right? That's our goal, we want 50%. We went looking for the best people 
for the job, period, and we built a team. And what I can tell you is I'm even more proud of the fact that my cohesive executive leadership team, so all-inclusive, is just driving terrific results right now for the company, for our shareholders, and ultimately for the people in the business. So I'm very proud of that. You, you all, and I'll say this, have the good fortune of having each other. Yeah. As senior executives, you can call on and, you know, late night say, hey, I'm thinking about this, going through that. <laughs> what would you recommend that those who don't have this ecosystem build or do? And how do you propose specifically that they do it? You know, you started in very large companies and they, those ecosystems may not naturally existed there. What did you do to create that or cultivate that? And I want to, you know, kind of circulate, circulate that one around. Sure. Um, so... Working for those three large West Coast-based companies, I always was based in New York, right? So I was always, for 20 years, flying west. Mm -hmm. uh, and I quickly realized early in my career that within the company, I need to be very proactive and prescriptive about building a network fast, both internally in the company and then externally in the industry. So what I did was this exercise early on. It's two circles like this. Mm -hmm. Your inner circle is everyone, all of the key stakeholders within your business. Who do you need to know? Make sure you have strong relationships. But almost even more importantly, those, that second layer of who are the influencers? Mm -hmm. Who are the leaders of other businesses? Who are potential mentors? And every single trip, I systematically made sure I was doing coffees, breakfasts, lunches with that second layer. Same thing in the industry. Right. Um, you know, being based here for 20 years, I have quite a network mm -hmm. externally, and I have friendships for life and right. um, colleagues and peers who they know I've got their back, they've got my back, mm -hmm. uh, and, and it takes work and energy, it's almost like working out. Like you just gotta make sure you continue to cultivate that network. Right, right. Yeah. Sage, so what, what are some of your thoughts? You know, um, I, I love that idea about the inner circle and the outer yeah. circle, I'm gonna use that. Um, if, if you don't have a network um, of women and, and other leaders that you can talk to and you can share with, um, find it. They're there, they're available. Um, it takes time. It takes commitment to build those relationships and then having the coffees, having the breakfast. Um, but it is so incredibly valuable to have um, so much. I mean, I, I call Amy and Lisa and I connect and, and uh, Monica, who you're gonna hear next, we've connected a bunch. Um, and, and we're lucky to have that, but also I would say, you know, you can build it. And if, if you don't, find, you know, when there's a break, Go talk to two or three women here today, That's right. and and and, right. and 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 exchange cards and and get to know one another and, and talk about um, ideas. And it's always great to be able to bounce ideas off of one another, um, get a fresh set of eyes, get a fresh perspective. Someone who's even not in your company today. Good. So, Amy, again, you spoke. Half of your senior executive team yeah. are women. How do you intentionally drive, you know, an environment where they feel that? They had their A empowered and B can empower more women within within Vertifor. You know, I think everybody plays a part in that, right? Um, I think first, you know, because we have 50% women on the executive team, we have a lot of role models in the business, right? And and I think people are constantly looking for role models. Hey, mm -hmm. look what they're doing. You heard Lisa talk about it. Right. I can do that too, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I think so. By nature, the most impactful thing that we've done to create that culture is establish role models, right? Mm -hmm. And really, really provide them the, the opportunity to support their teams. At the same time, you know, at Vertifor, we focus on outcomes, right? right? We don't focus on the process. We don't right. focus on the politics. We remove all that stuff. We really focus on outcomes. And at the end of the day, that creates a natural environment where the, the cream rises to the top, frankly, regardless of background experience, et cetera. Right. In fact, last year, mm -hmm. you're, you were named yeah. with a top executive through comparability of yeah. best places to work. So okay. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Congratulations Appreciate to that. that. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the, the, you know, what advice would you give yourself 20 years ago? You know, that question. And, you know, if you look back in your career and you say, okay, what do you wish someone would have told you or you should have told yourself then? And, well, Lisa, let's start with you. Um, I would say it's two things. Uh, the first is find your voice early on. And what I mean by that is, like I mentioned, I was always in New York dialing into conference calls. This is before video conference calls. Mm -hmm. 
typically the only woman dialing in. I've done it 5,000 times. Mm -hmm. And the sooner you get you know, a strong voice, you're articulate, you speak up, you have something to contribute to the meeting, you arrive prepped, you write out, here are the three points I'm going to make in this meeting. You don't let others speak over you, interrupt you, you know. And if they do, you call them out. Or what I used to do is I'd call them right after the meeting. And I'd mm -hmm. say, hey, I'm not sure if you're aware you just completely interrupted me. But please give me some space. And yeah. if you do it and you're that direct, um, they'll stop doing it, right? And the sooner you learn that, the second is, thing that I learned very quickly is once you become a working mom, it's a game changer. Mm -hmm. And ask for help. And wherever you can get it, the neighbors, <laughs> friends, <laughs> sitters, and it is OK. And you cannot perfect, have a perfect house and a perfect family and a perfect job. And you have to be OK with that, yeah. right? Right, right. Amy, what about you? What would you give uh, your, your 20 year old, you know, 20 years ago yourself? <sighs> Wear red shoes on stage. Hey! There you go. Yeah. I love it. No, you know, I think I, <laughs> funny. I try. Yeah. No, you know, I think I think at the end of the day, you know, you, you don't you don't have to be perfect. And it's really important that you get very comfortable admitting what you know and admitting what you don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I often, you know, see this trait in, in young women where they want to you know, be perfect right. and be afraid to acknowledge what they don't know. And in reality, it hurts you because when you demonstrate that you know what you know and you know what you don't know, you're demonstrating confidence. Right. And then when you ask thoughtful questions, you're demonstrating that you're a career learner, right? That's right. who you are. And when you show up next time and you've learned that and now you're the next layer of questions and you're answering, getting those answered, you're demonstrating potential. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we all want to do is we want to demonstrate confidence and potential. And I, I learned that, but I would, I would have learned it faster, frankly, yeah. along the way. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sajel? You know, I would say um, two things. So one, um, in, in I was lucky because I happened to take risks by having um, the the uh, you know the mentorship and the support of people to say it's it's good to take risks. But you know take take risks. Um, and I and I started with this: take that leap of faith, um, and 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 you'll really um, learn from it. Um, and then the second, and this is again since you talked about you know when you become a working mom. Um, when you are a mom, there's two things that I wish I had known at the very beginning when I first had children. Um, number one, give up control at times. It's okay. You can't control everything, right? right? Totally. And, and number two, um, you know, don't, don't think that you can have, you know, give up guilt. You know, don't think that, you know, it, it's, it's really important to realize that you're going to do the best you can, as, as you said, and uh, it's, it's good. Give up control and give up the guilt. I'll throw this out to any of you who want to answer it. You know, one of the things I always talk about is, you know, overcoming challenges. And if you would just, you know, talk about a challenge that you, that you had to meet head on and where you actually had to use this whole concept of grit or fortitude to kind of tough it out. Because I think that's one of the dynamics that is an important thing any senior executive needs to have. But in typically these male-dominated tech sectors, often that is one of the more important attributes that you need to demonstrate in the work that you're doing. So if you, any of you can pick that one, but just, just give me an example of where you had to overcome a challenge and, you know, and how you, how you, how you push through it, frankly. I'll call on you, too. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, Which one is what yeah. we're thinking? I'm thinking it's every day. Yeah, it's every day. <laughs> right? um, you know, I'll, I'll share one. It's kind of similar, actually, to Lisa. You had a story of this. And actually, Robert, it's really interesting because you actually did something similar in your younger days um, when you were trying to get an internship at Bell Labs. Right. Um, I was uh, looking to get an internship in college when I was a sophomore at General Electric. And I was not chosen. It was mostly juniors who were chosen. And, and I, similar to you, I called the head of the internship program as, as a sophomore in college um, multiple times and, and you know, sort of left voicemails saying, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if there's any feedback you can give me. I didn't get accepted into this internship program. And finally, I got in touch with him. And I'll never forget it. I was at a phone booth 
at Beach Week okay. <laughs> after finals my sophomore year in Nags Head, North Carolina. And I was, I had, you know, yeah. change in my pocket. And, yeah. You know, yeah. I was put, and, and, and I finally got in touch with him. And I said, you know, I've been calling. And he said, yes, I know. <laughs> uh, I've gotten your messages. Um, I was just wondering, is there anything that I can do better next year to be able to get this opportunity? And he said, you know what? I love the grit. I love, he didn't say the word grit, but mm -hmm. it is grit and perseverance. And, you know, why don't you, um, we're, we're going to find a spot for you for this summer. And, and it was the best internship and opportunity. And, and if I had just taken that rejection and said, okay, I guess right. I didn't get it, um, mm -hmm. it would never have happened. And, and sort of that grit, you know, and, and that was a, a, a lot of, of men in that internship as well. Um, and it was, it was a fantastic experience to be able to, to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. Amy? Yeah, I'll share. Uh, so I, I would say probably the experience I would share is that, you know, back when I was 24 and I was in this startup company, uh, you know, I've, I started to build this this reputation of always being the person willing to take on the hard job. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, we had this opportunity, super unique, to build a piece of software. Energy was deregulating across the United States. And the team said, Amy, can you, can you do this? We need to show it in eight weeks. And I said, what is it, right? Like, <laughs> right what, yeah. what, and they're like, well, here it is. Here's the vision, and here's mm -hmm. what we're going to do. And, mm -hmm. you know, there was this huge hill in front of us, and they said, here's a couple of people who are going to help you with this. Mm -hmm. I met these people. Nice to meet you. And, you know, we did that. In eight weeks, we figured out what it was. We put the prototype together. We delivered mm -hmm. absolutely fantastic demo. The people that I worked with during that time period and for the next few years still consider it some of the best times that they have had in sure, their career. Right. It was fun. It was awesome. We had great outcomes. So it's a little bit of inspiration, a little bit of hard work, a mm -hmm. little bit of leadership, a little bit of not being afraid to get into the details to really figure out how to get it done. You know, to me, it takes all of that together right. to really tackle right. some of those things. It's just interesting, you know, as you, as you mm -hmm. run a bigger, you know, ever-expanding company, yeah. how do you make sure that that is still one of the elements that's core in, in, your, in your troops? What do, you, what do yeah. you actually intentionally do to change or to, in, in, you know, infuse that in your culture? So it's, it's hard, right? Yeah. If, you, if you allow yourself in a larger company to sit back and talk about it, right. it doesn't happen, right. right? What you have to do is lead by example and lead through demonstration. And so, you know, there's not a meeting that I will sit in where if it's really critical and topical, you know, we will peel that onion. I will ask a zillion questions for us to get in there to really demonstrate, A, I'm willing to do it, so you need to do it. Mm -hmm. B, it's the critical component that will fundamentally make us successful and mm -hmm. make us better than anybody else in our, in our, comp in our competitive space. Yeah. So. Very good. Lisa, mm -hmm. let's talk about some challenge you had to overcome and how you had to use, you know, either grit sure. fortitude sure. In, in, your, in, your, in your current job or Previous yes, jobs, yeah. 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 Um, so when I joined Amazon, there was no ad business. Mm -hmm. I, jo I joined uh, to build a global billion dollar, highly profitable business. I joined six months pregnant, uh, and there were eight people on the team. That was it. Mm -hmm. And so I realized very quickly that I had to hire super fast and find as many people out there, and this is before Amazon was investing in media, like this was back when, yeah, it, there was no, yeah. not much there. Yeah. And I figured out that I need to hire people who uh, embraced ambiguity. They were comfortable that there was no playbook, to your point. There was no like, here you go, here's your job, and here's what the business plan is. There was no business plan. I literally would interview dozens and dozens of candidates every week and find those who just thrived on handing them a marker, mm -hmm. showing them a whiteboard, and saying, directionally, we need to get there. Can you come back to me with a 100-day plan tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And they're like, <laughs> done. And so, uh, and also, to your point, I had to demonstrate that, too, like that I thrive without the playbook. And uh, that's the world we're living in right. now at IAS is getting the company to think big, to get out of their comfort zone, to think big and bold, and where do we want to take the company, and be super comfortable with whiteboards mm -hmm. and markers. Right, love okay. it, love it. I'm going to open it up for questions uh, for the next 10, 15 minutes or so. So if you have a question, just stand up and, and, and shout it out. I don't know if we have mics in the back, but uh, we've got a question right here, please. Sorry, as leaders in your organization now, how are you guys 
Um, how are you guys thinking through as leaders um, developing policies that kind of bring about the inclusion that you're talking about? Like you mentioned joining when you were pregnant. Um, I know parental leave, both maternal and paternal, is kind of a big topic. How do you guys think through that? You know, I, I can start. Uh, when I when I first came uh, to Dealer Socket, we didn't have a paid maternity leave or paternity leave policy, and within the first few months, that was one of the things that um, I put in place. I thought it was a really important element to you know really creating that sense of inclusion. It helps attract women as well as as men, and and retain them as well, and and makes them realize that it is a, a good thing to be able to um, have both. A family and 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 uh, you know continue working and being successful and so that that paid paternity leave and maternity leave policy that we have has been you know very much applauded I think across the company um, that's one that's one example but uh -huh. Uh -huh. we did something similar we didn't have that I think the first step is acknowledging that you need to evaluate your policies and you really need to think them through and really make sure that they are encouraging that type of environment and when they're not be willing to adjust them, right? And I think establishing networks for your HR teams to actually have outside influence as well, so you're not just kind of controlled by what you guys do in your company, but you're actually learning from the best practices of others, I think that's another way that we try to do it. Yeah, just to add to that, I joined IAS in January, so I'm not even four months in. Within six weeks, uh, we improved our paid maternity, paid paternity, both for employees who uh, are expecting, employees who are already on leave, mm -hmm. uh, and it was just the right thing to do for the company. Has that, and then, well, I'll take another question in a second. Has, has that actually changed your, I know yours is new, but you know, change your recruiting dynamic and retention yeah. dynamic? Yes. Without question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the happiness of the employees as well. Mm -hmm. You know, right. even, even the ones that are there, they, they know that it's, it's an inclusive environment and it's safe to be able to say, you know what, I'm, I want to be with my child when, when he or she is born. Great. Another question right here. Hi. Thank you, panel. I appreciate um, uh, your coming and the talk. Um, my question is, and it's a, probably a complicated question, and I don't know how, if you can provide an answer, but I'm concerned about inequality, and, and we are moving very rapidly in an, in, into an automated world, and, and you're seeing in, inequality increasing. How can um, leadership with women who have this power um, level the playing field? Good question. So I'll take a shot, right? It's a complicated question, and there's not a simple answer to it at the end of the day, right? It's going to take all of us playing our roles to really do the right things that's going to change that, right? We need role models. We need people who are paying it forward and being mentors. We need to think about how do we affect um, young girls and drive more exposure, right? Uh, you know, we, we run a program at Vertifor that is sponsored through Vista around bringing young women, girls, and other minorities into expose them to technology, right? We do an hour of code and it's a fantastic program. We do it every few months. Um, my employees get a lot out of it, but I think exposing young people to that is really important. You know, we need to give them the exposure and then we need to give them the confidence to choose the path. Yeah, you know, I would agree. We do the hour of code as well and, and have for the last couple, year and a half, and it's fantastic. It, you know, one of the things that, you know, for the next generation and exposing them to technology and exposing them to that, um, I think all of us should also be um, working with our school districts. I'll give you an example. Right. So my daughter um, took her first coding class in school, loved it, literally just came home energized by the Coding 101 in, in when she was at her first semester of seventh grade last year. And I said, well, great. Now she was planning her classes for the spring. I said, why don't you take coding 102 because it's the next one. Mm -hmm. She said, no, that's not offered. That's only yeah. one coding class. Yeah. And, and, and I thought, well, now that you've grown and, and created this love for, for, for coding, what do you do next? And, and so we, we should work with our school districts and try to say there's more than just one class mm -hmm. that we should be doing. So it's, it's, and, then, and then within our own companies, um, you know, we're, we're CEOs and we're creating inclusive environments across our company, but for everyone in the room, 
you should look at whether you have a team, whether you have a business unit, whether you know, you're know you just starting at your company and start looking at ways that you can create inclusive environments. It doesn't have to be that you have to wait for the top to do it. Right. right? You could start it from anywhere. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. Oh, Lisa, you want to comment yeah, on that? Um, the one other thing uh, that we're involved in with VISTA is summer internships. Right. Uh, and we have 20 interns coming in this summer. And also, it's a great opportunity um, to bring in diver diverse students, uh, students who are interested in learning more about tech. Uh, but as important as to bring the interns in is to train our staff mm -hmm. how to mentor them, coach them, train them, because it is a different population, yeah. right? A population that hasn't been in the workforce yet, uh, but to give them the richest experience possible so that when they do head out into the workforce and hopefully come back and work for IAS, yeah. um, that they're, they feel better prepared. You know, obviously at Vista, we, we, we believe strongly in what I call these on-ramps of opportunity, you know, beyond the hours of code and the internships. You know, Betty, who's gonna speak uh, in a bit, one of our, our partners at Vista, uh, is on the board of uh, Girls Who Invest. And uh, every year we, mm -hmm on ramp how many interns do we have a year now betty at, at vista we have tim but overall in the program 150 or so to expose women to investing so they can become professional managers of money which again it's kind of two three percent uh are is kind of the numbers whereas you know obviously we, we need to have numbers that are more reflective of what what the society and the contribution of you know the to the contribution that goes into these pension plans actually looks like and like all things, everybody has to do their part in the ecosystem, mm -hmm. okay? Part of the ecosystem is ensuring we are building talented mentors for interns, right. exposing our kids to coding yes. environments, making sure our school districts, if they're not in the school districts, there's after school programs, things that we work on as well, yeah. to ensure that kids have this chance to ex get, get exposed to what is this new economy to make sure they're not disenfranchised, kind of point number one. Right. And then point number two, that they can identify role models who are successful in it. Mm -hmm. So, and part of that is also building out your middle management mm -hmm. with, with people who you can cultivate and, and mentor. And I think at Vista, one of the things that Betty leads in our organization is, is it next week we're gonna have the Women's uh, Summit? And how many women are we gonna have at that? 300-ish or something? Not. Okay, um, and, and, and part of that is, you know, best practice, value sharing, mentorship, connectivity, and all the dynamics uh, that I think are important uh, to ensure that people feel that A, they're not alone and they can identify with, with other leaders who look, act, or have similar circumstances. I saw a question in the back. If you want to stand up, and I have one over here. I know I saw you as well. Hi, Lisa Portney here, class, CBS Class of 2021. Um, I think we have a lot of these organizations have inclusivity. Can you speak up, please? Yeah. I think a lot of organizations have inclusivity and diversity as a goal, yeah. and setting quotas can be a slippery slope. But looking back is often a good way to see where you are in terms of inclusivity. But um, how will you, when will you feel like you've achieved your goals? How do you, how do you determine that? At what point do you, do you decide? Hmm. You know, for, for us, and, you know, I really believe that diversity creates more diversity. And so, you know, is there a set number? You know, as, as Robert mentioned earlier, you know, the automotive industry, it's interesting because more than 84% of automotive purchases are influenced by women, and yet such a small percentage of women are in the automotive industry, right. and then you add an automotive and technology together, which is what my company does, and, and what we really wanna focus on is finding and, and cultivating women to join the organization, our organization, and then rise up and, and have that meritocracy. So, um, you know, one, I don't know if this answers the question, but you know, one of the things that we're creating is a, a program internally called Women of Dealer Socket, and it's a company-wide employee group. Um, I did the same at my previous company, Active Network, where we called it Active Women's Network, and we met on the third Thursday of every month um, and, and had different focus areas around empowering, engaging, um, and, and, uh, and really around learning. 
And, and you know, I, I don't know if there's ever a time where we say the goal is met, but I think that as we create more of these kinds of policies and programs and opportunities and have meritocracy as a really big focus for the organization, um, you know, it just becomes that diversity creates more diversity and, and you get a really great view of, of, of changing ways of running the business. I think, you know, I, I'll, I'll opine on this a bit. You know, in my mind, it, it's when we no longer have to have a panel about women <laughs> CEOs in tech, right. we're done. Right. Right? Because now we're just CEOs. <laughs> right. Um, and it is, it, is, it is our role uh, at Vista, in, and I, I, I tell our team this, you know, we have the most diverse private equity firm on the planet. We have the highest returns and lowest loss ratio because of that. Okay, and I think there will be a recognition that it, a recognition that it is the diversity that makes us very successful at what we do, and that I hope will, will create the realization that this is the right thing to do, and it's the only way to actually participate in an economy going forward. There's a question I know you. And we also have a question on Facebook Live, if we can get to that one at some point too. It's hard to hear you. Oh, there's a question from Facebook Live as well. Okay, okay. all right, let's have this question first, and we'll. Last question? Okay, this will be the last question, sorry. Go ahead, shout it out. Yes. Yeah, so much. Um, I 100% and wholeheartedly agree. I love that you guys have a network amongst each other and I feel like women really need to do a better job of like networking with each other and lifting each other up and referring each other for jobs because men do a great job of that. My question is, as you became leaders and moved up through the ranks, how did you handle having hard conversations and perhaps constructive feedback in male-dominated industries, particularly when you have to give feedback to men or women? Um, but for me, that's always that's been a challenge. So. Okay. I, I would say be confident. You know, trust your gut, trust your instinct. Um, you are in a leadership role, giving feedback to a peer or to a direct report for a reason, right? You. You know, and you know if, if it helps, you know, prep beforehand to make sure, you know, the first couple of times that you're doing it. But but have that confidence, that, that inner strength, because you're all amazing and, and you're able to do it. Um, men shouldn't be intimidating to you. Um, and, 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 you know, they're just people. Yeah. So I, I would add, if, it, if it's okay, you know, to remove the emotion from feedback conversations. Just remove it. Remove it from when you're receiving feedback and remove the emotion when you're giving it. Because at the end of the day, feedback is a gift, right? We're constant learners. Every one of us in this room can be better at what we do. And so if you take it with that true intention and you give it with that true intention, it's going to land properly. Great. Lisa, anything you want to add to that? It's the same. Um, wherever I go, I try to create a culture that feedback is a gift. I talk about it quite a bit. And as a leader, being more receptive to that feedback at any level that anyone can come to me and give me the hard mm -hmm. feedback and then see me change behavior or change you know, mm -hmm. a policy in the company, what happens is you create this culture where it's no longer that difficult to give that tough feedback. Great. So I want to thank you, ladies, for being here and for leading these great companies, thank being you. great role models, sharing some ideas, thoughts, some of your personal perspectives uh, with this audience. And I'm going to ask the audience to just make sure you reflect on these words that they said. These are some of the most successful CEOs we have in our portfolio. Uh, and, and the short answer is, you know, I wish we could replicate you and we will continue to work with each other to replicate you uh, in, in what we do going forward. So thanks again, Sejal and Amy Thank and you. Lisa. So Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you.